Ah, and we're live. Welcome to Earful of Dirt Lineouts, episode nine. And I've got Holden Younger with me, the uh, five-year St. Mary's College uh, rugby player. Uh, one of those years he got injured pretty early, so it kind of knocked him out. Uh, he is a men's senior All-American. He was an All-American selectee for the All-Americans match against the Oxford Blues. He is also uh, a guy who got to have a great experience in the Australian Capital Territory Brumbies Academy and then was a USA Select this summer down in Uruguay mm -hmm. uh, during the America's Pacific Challenge. And finally, he is the scrum half for your New Orleans Gold Rugby Club. How's it going, Holden? Well, it's going well. Thanks for having me on the show, Aaron. Um, well, you got all the background information right, so you know it's going well. I'm it took forward it, to uh, the next year. It took me a few minutes to research all of that and make sure it like came out correctly. Yeah, spot on. So, so, um, uh, so I noticed uh, you didn't start playing rugby till uh, high school. So, growing up, you played a, a lot of high level soccer. What position did you play? Um, so, I mean, my whole soccer career, you know, it's starting at like under sixes or whatever when my dad was coaching to uh, playing a bit in high school. I was really a utility player. I could play, uh, I played, I started at defense, played a little bit of a uh, striker up top. Um, my favorite, which I think translates a bit better to rugby, is, uh, you know, the midfield position where you're controlling the pace and kind of, you know, ball placement on the field. Nice. Um, I played soccer for like three years as a child. Uh, midfield, goalie, you know, goalie's kind of like center field. When you're like se seven years old, it's where you get hidden, um, you know. Uh, so I have played soccer. It's okay. I mean, it's a great way to get kids active. The amount of kids I watch on Saturdays when I go, uh, you know, go riding or even when we have a, a rugby match out in the skirts, uh, there's just – the amount of kids playing soccer is just crazy. Yeah, it's so they're all um, passionate about it too. That's the best part. So when you made the transition to rugby at Petaluma, and also uh, at Marin Youth, why did you move on from you know that little round thing to chase the egg <laughs> to an odd shaped ball? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It was a decision that came up uh, when I was a freshman in high school. And it was one of those things where I think my body was changing. I was getting a bit slower and less technical with a, with a soccer ball and a little more aggressive. And my father had played back in the 80s, back in like a social club here in California. And um, my uncle played in San Francisco. And it's just kind of been around the family. Um, and I got my hands on a ball and just loved it. So I found uh, the Marin Highlanders Rugby Club, and that was, uh, that was my first step into the game. Awesome. So when did you begin playing scrum half, and how many did, positions did you play in high school? Yeah, so I've never, um, I've never been one of those guys that's uh, really multi-positional. Okay. Just, I, started as a, I started as a fullback. Um, coming from soccer, I could, I could put the ball on my foot, um, had a little bit of vision, didn't necessarily have the skills um, I do now, but that slowly transitioned into, you know, one of the scrum halves went down. They needed just someone in there that would wanted to play, run around, toss the ball. And uh, ever since then, I haven't been able to escape it. Yeah, like um, you hear a lot of dudes talk about the positions that you need to play from a very young age. I mean, you've scrum half is one of those, fly half is one of those to like be extremely proficient to say move towards the national team level. But I think, I mean, for you, based on your body of work, you actually, I mean, you didn't play, you know rugby at six years old like playing scrum half so that says a lot about what you've been able to accomplish in the last couple of years and then uh you know you went to a crazy rugby school that could definitely 
uh, you know, take the sharpening stool and hone, and hone the edge. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those positions that I think, um, where every game under your belt, you get a little bit better. You learn something, you learn, uh, you know, something that worked, something that definitely didn't work. Um, I know in my time at St. Mary's, I learned some things that I will never do again. And just, you know, just really hard lesson. <laughs> the next game, you know, ends up better because you don't do things like that. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, it's a, and I think it's one of those, it's a position that kind of gets better with age as well. As you, uh, you know, you get experience, your IQ grows every day and you know that's what makes a good scrum out putting in the time putting in the effort just getting the reps really so what was getting recruited to play rugby like uh because i mean you see you know on espn especially on twitter now i'm going to sign with this school it used to be all the hats now it's just like a twitter thing and mm -hmm. so you know in in the bay you've got st mary's you've got cal was there a tug of war there um so when i was in high school when i was looking at playing rugby in college um growing up in the bay i mean cal rugby when i was playing in high school was the school to go to if you wanted to play rugby if you wanted to win it was cal rugby um my coach went to cal so he wanted us to go to cal and uh you know that was the goal i ended up not getting into cal um it's a, it's a tough place to get into yeah right right very uh you know not a shocker i was bummed but um i ended up playing on this uh high school u18 all-star team and the coach the coach told us pretty straight up if you guys want to play rugby look at saint mary's and next thing you know, I'm on the internet. I uh, emailed the coach, and it was very nonchalant. Um, I don't know how much you know about Tim O'Brien or Johnny Everett, um, the head coaches there, but I know that they're, they're good. Yeah, I, they're, I mean, like uh, there was a. I know. I mean, people who don't, for people who don't know at home, Tim is a Hall of Fame coach. So, I mean, one of the best, easily. So it's it's kind of like, you know. I mean, you, the, the reputation of your coaching staff sort of precedes itself because mm -hmm. especially when, um, you know, Tim got selected for the Hall of Fame, it was like a big thing. And I was like, oh, ah, oh wow. I, yeah. Things I didn't know because, you know, um, sort of, you know, rugby is like microcosm in, a, in of itself and then you get siloed depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. And obviously I knew about Jack Clark at – Coach Clark at Cal, you know. Everyone knows about Cal, and at the time, I was like, St. Mary's, and then, like, I remember reading this long article about, uh, you know, Coach O'Brien, and then, like, the guys before him, yeah. and it was like, wow, like, so, like, th there's been a significant investment in St. Mary's rugby for a very long time that some people don't know about, I know about now. But it's just wow. Yeah, and it's all it's all come into come into light in the last you know five to ten years. You know when the program has really become successful. But those guys, their recruiting process is um, very nonchalant. Like I know for myself, I did a lot of the a lot of the groundwork, uh, finding them, contacting them, um, setting up kind of a preemptive interview, um, and you know after meeting them, it just it just stuck that seemed like the place for me and uh they got me in they helped get me in and i loved it i mean that was definitely the best option i could have taken i think in college rugby so specifically the college you were you had an environmental science degree yes why like i mean i i i took so i took environmental science advanced placement environmental science in uh in high school and i'm just like yeah this is great this is great i like this this would be fun to do in like real life and then it's like oh wait the there there's not a lot of jobs yeah no uh, not right now especially but i mean it's uh the world we live in is uh it's crazy it's important i think there's a lot of things that we can do to you know 
sustain it and sustain ourselves with it. And, uh, you know, I think I, I want to be one of those guys that's making a, uh, an active attempt at, you know, leaving the, the world better than when, how we got it, you know? Nice. Definitely. For sure. So over the years, uh, you know, you faced life university in several high level matches in the playoffs in the D1A final in, at the CRC. So how would you characterize that rivalry? Oh, they're always lurking there. You know, they're always at the edge of the, they're just, they're pure competitors. Um, I had the pleasure of playing with coach, uh, under coach Lawrence after uh, in Uruguay with the selects and, you know, playing with some of these life guys that, you know, you hate them on the field. You see them. It's like, that's the game to play every year. And, um, they're, they're some of the nicest guys out there. I don't know what it is, but the guys you hate the most while you play them are the guys you're, you know, biggest friends with off the field. Um, but I would just sum them up as they're, they're, they're competitors. They want to win. They want to play good rugby. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll put you through a fight to do that. Then this year, uh, a little bit before the playoffs, you guys faced Cal. Uh, what was it? I mean, your guys' schedule at the end of the year was pretty, pretty intense. What is the, I mean, what is the Cal St. Mary's rivalry like right now, and you know, in the past when you first started? Uh, it's always been a big one. So what? That's the game all the alumni want. Everybody wants to beat Cal, um, you know, because they're they're just the pinnacle of college rugby. Essentially. Um, and so it's always been really heated because you, you go out and I mean, St. Mary's and Cal are only about 15, 20 miles away from each other. Um, like, you know, over the Hills. And, um, so you go out and you see a lot of these guys and I don't know, you grew up playing against them and it's just, it's fiery. Everybody wants to win that game, you know, whether they're on Cal or St. Mary's or it's, uh, it's a lot for bragging rights and, you know, just to kind of rub it, rub it in these guys' faces, you know, if you get the win. Let's see. Um, so your senior season uh, was a super senior season. I know what those are like. Um, you earned a ton of – A victory lap. You earned a ton of accolades. Uh, at what point did you know it was going to be a special one? So I broke my arm – the year before my last year um, at St. Mary's. And so I missed the second half of my, uh, I guess, my, se my real senior season um, with a broken arm. And I just, I came into it. I knew I wanted to make my last season count. And I really wanted to, you know, push the pace, push the team. I think we had the right guys on it. So from the very start, our leadership group was ready you know, ready to play the game and play to win by the end of the year. So five years at SMC, you win three national titles, national semifinalists the other two years. What, what does that take? It takes a lot. I think um, it takes a few special things from, I'd say the biggest is who you do it with. Um, who's, you know, your tools of the trade, essentially. Um, that and the time and the effort. Um, I know we, it would have been difficult to do it without Tim and Johnny um, as our head coaches. I know it definitely would have been difficult to do it without them. Um, and the guys that we did it with were just – on that team, it was the chemistry was there. Everyone was hungry, showed up to practice, showed up to play. Um, everybody just wanted to, you know, win and do their job, do it for the team. How many crossover athletes uh, have made an impact at St. Mary's versus other college? Uh, I would characterize, you know, a crossover as someone with less than three years of experience. So... That's a pretty good question. Um, off the top of my head, there's not a lot. 
there are a few, you know, standout athletes that come to mind, guys that they came and they, they came in and they played football. There's no football at St. Mary's, so they went to rugby. Next thing you know, you have one of these big guys who he's an outstanding prop. He just got raw materials for the coaches to work with. And then, you know, two years down the line, he's in the starting lineup. Guys like, uh, for instance, Dino Waldron. Dino. That guy's yeah, a... he, He's an animal. Yeah. He, he, he only like started him. playing rugby when he got to St. Mary's. That's awesome. And there's a few. Yeah. So there's, there's a few. Um, there's a few guys that come in and, you know, they have the materials. They're like, they're like clay. And then it's up to the team and Tim and Johnny to really mold them. For, I mean, I, I know what that's like uh, looking, you know, back to the, where I went to college. They're like, we have a full-time head coach, but there's no recruiting budget. Like a lot, some of these D1A schools like Lindenwood, Cal, they, they go out and recruit kids like nationwide. And you know, most guys that play at VMI, very few of them play before they get there. Like, there were a few guys uh, when I was in school that went to Culver, and rugby is a huge, uh, huge sport at that private school. Like, those guys go everywhere. And I was like, okay, um, that's cool. But uh, most of the guys, that they, they come in, um, and they just learn, and that's what it – for them, that's why it's taking you know, – yeah, you have a full-time head coach, but it can take you 10, 15 years to get a team, you know, in the national playoff past, like, a certain round. And then it's what I like to call, you know, if you go to a small high school in football, it's your every once-a-decade team. Mm -hmm. So it was like their once-a-decade team this year. So that's, I mean, that's good to see that uh, the, the reach of St. Mary's College is just, it attracts, you know, some of the best rugby players in the country. Yeah, and it's great. I mean, last time I went back to St. Mary's, um, you know, about a month ago, and seeing these new freshman kids that come in, um, I think as rugby grows, it's becoming increasingly rare, rarer to find, you know, kids that haven't played before. And so all these freshman kids on the St. Mary's team, they now you – know, there's kids with four or five years of experience under their belts by the time they're playing college rugby. And so it just really allows, a, you know, the game to develop that much quicker. A question from, uh, like, the Reddit board that we run. Um, so right now a lot of you guys at Cal and St. Mary's specifically – are doing like five years. Uh, do you think that the emergence of Major League Rugby is going to, you know, accelerate the the graduation rates of you guys? Or, you know, I mean, you got injured, so I, I suspect you just wanted to play an extra year of rugby. Yeah, that was and, a big reason for me. Um, I hope so. I think that – I think if you can do your college in four years and, I mean, debatably – the high-level college teams are playing some of the best rugby in the in the nation right now, and so there's not a lot of reason to leave. You know, if you can stay an extra year, but I'm really hoping with this MLR that you know some of the some of the really bright talent, you know, does their four and then they come and play for an MLR team. You know, we'll just pick up from there. What makes Coach O'Brien and the rest of the staff, I think I, I looked at the, the website, the St. Mary's website said you guys have five men's assistants. That's as professional of a coaching setup as one can have at the collegiate level. Yeah. Um, what makes that special? And next the level. Biggest benefit. Yeah, I think the biggest benefit is you just have more eyes on the game, you know, between Tim and Johnny, they're – you know, that's more rugby knowledge than I think I'll ever have in my life. Um, and then you tag three more guys on there that have been playing since, you know, since the 80s. They played with old blues or they played in their college sides or overseas. And it just adds, you know, what maybe one coach can't communicate, another will, what another doesn't, another, you know, can. And um, it just gives you eyes on the game. It gives you different voices. Um, different ways that the co coaches communicate and, you know, the players receive that all differently. So I think when you hear the same thing five different ways, 
um, that's one of the things that really helps it stick with you. It makes one of the things I look at, what, one of the things I look at when it comes to the big schools, so like uh, Arizona State or um, say Penn State or Ohio State or whatnot, and I look at specifically, you know, schools that have student populations of like 60,000, um, they have, I would say, inherent advantages over St. Mary's College. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a, a male student population of around a thousand. Um, how are, how does that, like, is that an, an advantage or disadvantage to building an elite rugby program? How do you, I would say, work with that to, you know, be a perennial title contender and champion? I think, when a, I think it is almost a benefit in a way. Um, you know, going to a, a smaller school perhaps has less distractions um, in certain ways, more in others. Um, but I think part of it also is just, I mean, it, it can work with any team, but I think the camaraderie and kind of the uh, closeness, chemistry of the team, much stronger with, you know, a smaller base of people to grow from. We'll touch on this again, but you've sought high-level playing opportunities to develop often. Uh, this past summer, you played in the Shoot Shield with East Rugby Club and were even called into the Australian Capital Ter Territory, Brumbies Academy, uh, for the John Dent Comp. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Uh, how did that push you for higher level opportunities late in the summer? Uh, so it was really lucky. It was actually very quick how I ended up there. I got a call from um, Coach, Coach Tim, um, asked me if I wanted to play, asked me what I was doing over the summer. Um, and I kind of gave him like a really, really no answer. And then he goes, well, if you want to go to Australia, here's your chance. And, um, Sends, he sent me a picture of a, a plane flight, you know, and it leaves Sunday and he called me on a Thursday. <laughs> so, yeah. So it was just like it, how I ended up in Australia was just a, it was a whirlwind to me. Um, but I ended up at the, yeah, at the Brumbies facilities and um, playing in Canberra. And I mean, I think it was one of the best things for me. It's a new style of rugby. Uh, definitely very hard nosed. Um, much more than I was expecting. The skill was there. Everybody, you know, everybody's just out to win and to, you know, dominate every every piece of play they can. And so that's helped me grow phenomenally. I mean, the first game I played in in uh, Canberra, I suited up. I got first grade um, for the team, the East, and then I was playing against like five different Brumbies on the other side. And, you know, they're like, if you can't play with the best, you sure as hell want to play against the best, you know? So. That's, that's awesome. That gives, you, that gives you another connection to your head coach because uh, he, was a, he was a Brumbies Academy player a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I can't escape the East. So. So, but yeah, that's, that, that had to have been just an awesome experience right there. Yeah, once, so, once in a lifetime, you know. So this summer you, I guess, not this summer, but this year you, you like really broke out. Uh, we talked before the show that, you know, you were in and around like the junior All-American camp for a while. And, you know, this year you got named a senior All-American and then you were selected to, uh, you know, the senior All-American side to play against, you know, Oxford. Uh, you know, what's the difference in, like, those setups, like, before, like, you, you know, you said you didn't make it into the U20 side, but, uh, I mean, I, I guess it doesn't matter at this point, you know? Yeah, it's all, uh, all in the past. I'd say the, the main difference between those is, um, as we get older, going from U20s to just collegiate, um, or junior All-Americans to collegiate All-Americans. I think that the age difference and maybe the uh, 
attention and intensity changes in like the most beneficial way possible. Um, and just, I'd say the focus, the focus is there that you need to compete and, uh, you know, to have a good training to get the result you want. What's the, like the difference uh, between the coaches you play with and then, you know, Gavin Hickey was the senior all Americans coach. What was, what made him different versus the other coaches you've had? I don't know if there's a lot really. I've I've started to notice that there's a uh, there's some some similarities between all like these really high level coaches, at least the ones I've had, um, and I enjoy it. I mean, they're all great guys. They all seem to play some. Maybe it's just my opinion, but they play a, a couple mind games with you. Um, you know, keep you on your toes, keep you uh, on on edge, but. I think they they just want you to succeed. They want you to test yourself in ways possible. Um, so I'd say there's more similarities than differences between these top level coaches. So you've been in the in and around the Eagles system for a while. Um, this year, I mean, you made it all the way. Basically, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're pretty close to being – if you are not called into the ARC squad, I, I mean, I, I told uh, – after watching you play uh, with the USA Selects and help them lead to second-place finish in the American Pacific Challenge, uh, you know, I said to, your, I said to Nate Osborne, the, your coach at, at NOLA, it's like if he's not selected to play in the ARC – Something's wrong because I, you're you're good, man. You're good. Uh, yeah, working on it. What was the experience like from camp in Miami to jumping down to Uruguay for the America's Pacific Challenge? Oh, it was the best. That I'd say that was my first. Besides the Collegiate All Americans, that was my first time in a uh, in a program like that. Going from training camp to. Uh, I mean, two days at training camp where you're practicing in the morning, meeting, lunch, practice at in the evening, you know, dinner. It's monitored. It's all very professional. And they, they take a lot of the uh, kind of the outside work off you so you can focus on what you're doing on the field, um, building these really quick relationships with guys that, you know, you may never play again with. Um, I just had the best time in, in Uruguay and, you know, met a bunch of great guys, traveled around a bit, got to toss the ball around, played, you know, good competition. Um, and so I really just think that's what it's all about. You know, that's, I think why we play rugby. Oh yeah. I was definitely like with the form you guys had worked into, I was really disappointed that uh, you guys didn't play Argentina because I wanted to, after that last game, I really wanted to see you guys play. I know been... No, Argentina was – they were class. I remember watching them play Uruguay, and they uh, they looked like a handful. So, we will get a shot at them in the, uh, you know, in the ARC. Oh, yeah. So, it seems it took you guys some time to gel. Um, what do you think could have sped up that process? So, that's a – I don't know. There's so many different things. I think, I think the main thing is just time. Um, especially with guys you haven't played with before, there's small tendencies that, you know, you just have to learn from each guy, whether one guy, you know, likes to look over this shoulder to pass or like if he's always in the spot for a switch or, you know, a little Gregan ball or something. Like that. There's certain guys that you can key off on. You know, maybe a few more days would have given us a little more time to gel, a little more uh, chemistry. But I thought I thought we did really well with getting to know everyone and uh, really becoming a team by the end of that. Uh... So after after watching those minutes. Yeah, after watching those three matches that you guys played, uh, I would put you and uh, your uh, 
I guess, your rival, Ruben de Haas in the top three American scrum halves right now. Yeah. Like, what are you doing right now to push you yourself into the Eagles training squad? I mean, this last summer, we saw you do tons of stuff. Uh, this last year, I guess, you've really pushed yourself to get close. So what is, what is your next step? So right now, I mean, I'm just trying to stay healthy, keep my hands on the ball, um, you know, keep the little skills up, keep the fitness up. I'd say the big thing for me is, you know, with the holiday season, I got to keep, uh, keep an arm's distance from the dessert table. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, man. that's the main thing I'm focusing oh, on, right now, you know? Uh, well, I mean, you're a you're a back, so it's not, you probably have to keep yourself away from that, anyways. And just uh, a half a half back, you know. So um, yeah, yeah, staying in shape over the holidays is always kind of kind of one of those things, especially where I used to play rugby. Uh, we would uh, we'd have a split season. So in Arizona, they play like straight in the spring, like it's. Mm -hmm. uh, 11 games in 13 weeks this year. Again, it was just like last spring. Whereas we would do six and five uh, when I was living in Texas, in El Paso. So it was kind of weird. So you'd have guys like, it was like, thank God we didn't have games in like January because, <laughs> yeah. you know, everyone's slow, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they got that, you know, a couple pounds of turkey or, you know, ham or whatever on them. So, yeah. awesome. So, you know, it became known that you were looking to pursue professional rugby early last spring. Uh, after bringing the Brumbies Academy, like, what were your options before signing with NOLA? Um, so, I was... I was trying to keep my options open. Um, coming off the selects tour, I was, I knew I wanted to play. Where was the question? Um, and being, being in Australia, I hadn't really heard much about the MLR. Um, so that was new to me. And I mean, where I got most of my information for, for these teams was just from other players on that tour. Um, and so I was either looking at, you know, joining an MLR team, like, has happened or you know the potential of going back down to australia or you know ireland maybe i think for me the part of the passion with rugby is where it can take you and uh who you can who you can play it with so i was in the mindset of you know while i'm young and you know somewhat capable like why not chase the dream all over the world yeah for sure that's like uh see some guys obviously you know todd clever he like he's played you know rugby all over the world playing in super playing in like japan top league playing in the aviva premiership uh you know curry cups like that's a great way i'll be honest that's a great way to lead a life if you could be a bit of a rugby vagabond like you know like T todd clever has been or uh you know, James Haskell in, his, in the early part of his career when he went down, you know, mm -hmm. to New Zealand. So that's, I mean, that's awesome. I'd love to be 24 again. I'm only 29. But, <laughs> but uh, I ain't that old, but dang. Uh, sometimes I wish, like, I was, like, just leaving college again. But um, Yeah, you know, the, the world's out there. So you said, uh, you know, most of the stuff you found out about the league uh, while you were uh, in Australia came from a lot of players. Uh, how did you start the recruitment process with New Orleans? Um, so it was actually after the Uruguay game. One of the, one of the boys came up to me, um, and he asked me if he could pass on my number. Um, to Nate Osborne, Coach Nate. And next thing you know, I get a call from, from the coach. And we had a great conversation. Um, he put me through to the GM, and we talked a bit. Um, and, you know, they sold it on me. You know, they wanted me, uh, which I liked. 
and New Orleans sounds like an awesome place. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm I've never been, so I'm jumping into this whole thing. I um, I've been through the airport. Uh, they have a there's a brand of chips. Look for I think it's called Zaps Voodoo yeah. Chips. Look for Voodoo mm. Chips. It's they're, they're it's perfect. Amazing. Yeah, I'll put I'll put that on my list. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, so many things. There's so many things to eat down there. Oh yeah, so I'm sure like, I'll be on my hands full. That's gonna be. I think that's you guys are gonna. Everyone going to New Orleans is gonna have a great time, especially uh, looking at the side you uh, you guys have put together. You know, you're gonna play at the Hinge with JP. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's. Uh, I think it's gonna be pretty. Pretty awesome, you know, halfback pairing. Yeah, that's going to be out there. Uh, you know, for the most part, I mean, not really the most part, the entire part. Like the, I've been impressed with all of the teams, but also with what New or- with what New Orleans has put together, especially over the last like couple of months. Because at the beginning, you know, I would say I'm one of the more cynical people uh, covering this league. Although I want it, I, I want this thing to I want this thing to happen. Like I want it to go, but there's some things that have left some bad taste in my mouth. And everything that uh, New Orleans has done has been uh, first class. Uh, talking to you know the general manager Ryan Fitzgerald and your head coach Nate Osborne, great people. So um, everything's been great, and I I can't wait to see what you guys. When everyone's together, what you guys do, it'd be pretty awesome. Especially, you know, with... I think, I mean... Uh, you good? You know, with the lineup thing, and... Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, go. Yeah, sky's the limit. Um, I don't know what to expect right now. I think... Um, but I think that the potential is there. Um, we just got to buy in, put in the time, put in the structure, um, and stay hungry, you know? And I think from what I hear, everybody, that's the goal. Yeah, you guys have uh, – I mean, you've got some pretty good preseason matches. I know you'll play, you know, the Glendale Raptors uh, pretty early uh, in a preseason matchup. And then you've also got the Capital Selects coming down uh, – you know, they just went out and they beat the USA South Panthers. And, you know, this is coming off of South Panthers playing and, like, winning the Rand cha- uh, Rugby America's North Championship. So it's not like uh, the South Panthers are something to sneeze at when, you know, they're going out there and beating all the Tier 3 countries in, uh, in Rugby America's North in this, like, I guess – not really an America's Rugby Championship B because there's going to be something else like that, but, you know, just all the Caribbean countries and Mexico. Like, it's, it's something to be said that, hey, that side's pretty good um, versus national teams. So I think you guys have some pretty good preseason fixtures that you'll be able to test yourselves at and see where you are at the beginning of the year. But I think you guys are going to be pretty good. Like, I think people are un- underestimating – or not paying it, or I wouldn't say underestimating. I'll be honest. I would say not paying attention. Yeah, I think we could be a bit of a dark horse team. Um, you know, I think uh, being at St. Mary's, I've always played with this kind of underdog attitude. Um, you know, even when even when we started winning championships, we're still we're still the little guys. You know, um, so I think if we take that same mentality, and you know. If people underestimate us or, you know, aren't paying attention, then I think very quickly we can give them something to pay attention to. So, here's some fun stuff. Why do people say hella in NorCal? Um, <laughs> like, I – that became like a cool. – that became a thing, I think, in high school. All of a sudden people yeah. are, like, saying it in SoCal, and I'm like, no, don't. No, it's the no. it's the best word. It, it's so multi-dimensional. You can use it in any context. Um, there's hella ways to use the word hella, <laughs> and it's just it doesn't get any better than that. It rolls off the tongue. You know, you can put it in anything really. <laughs> um. 
So moldeds or studs? Studded. Oh, good. Good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. I don't, yeah. It's got to be, they got to be some spikes on there, you know? Yeah, so I don't know how our sevens team plays, but I, I, I spent some time with the Canadian sevens team for with Silicon Valley sevens. And I asked the dudes, I was like, so do you guys get boots from Under Armour? And they were like, no, they don't. I mean, we, it's like player preference right now. Like the captain, you know, he's got a deal. But, yeah. and he's like, so do you, do you play with moldeds? Or he's like, no. Because he, with how much they play, they would, they, the guy, it was like one of the guys said they would need five pairs a year. Oh, yeah. Easily. You're, if you're on those every day, you know, it's only a matter of time before you wear down the plastic. So, I prefer moldeds to train in just because doing the, you know, depending on the field, how hard it is. How, um, but definitely on game day, it's got to be studs or nothing. Studs or nothing. Ha ha. Yeah. Play barefoot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get some grippy toes, I guess. So, uh, let's see. There was something, there was something else that was cool. Um, so, are you like, what is the quintessential Bay Area food? that you're into versus what you're looking for to try when you get to New Orleans. Because everyone talks about the Cajun food. Yeah. New Orleans. Yeah. So I guess in the Bay area, especially where I'm from, it's a lot of, they're head first into this kind of fresh food, local food movement. Um, and it's, I mean, that's a lot of places, but it's very fusiony out here and I'm looking I'm looking for a taste of, you know, something. I never grew up eating grits or anything like that. So I want something like that for breakfast. I'm really looking for, uh, or, uh, you know, eat some mud bugs. I think they call them out there. Mud bugs. Yeah. It's something like that. I don't know the lingo yet. I want, I did, I would say that I've had grits a few different times. And then the last time I had gr shrimp and grits, it was delicious. You can people can mess up grits. All right, I'll be honest. And yeah. most of the time, I've had grits. It's pretty it's yeah, rough. That or a yeah, you know, it's something different. I'm just looking to you know, and everything down there, just embrace the uh, you know the culture, the lifestyle, the the food. Um, any wrong ways you can do it down there. So, I think that about wraps it up. So, what is Let's see. What is the best tour story that is cleared for public consumption you have? Oh, man. Let's see. So I've been on a few. I guess the best one I've got right now, and I'm sure I'll get you know a few more in the years. Um, I don't know if you can see. I've got this scar right here up here. Oh, shit. Classic, <laughs> rugby, classic rugby scar, right? Um, freshman year at St. Mary's. We're in Italy. Um, I'm playing goal line stand, and out of nowhere, man, it hits me. Lights are out. I wake up. I'm in the end zone. Blood, I'm bleeding everywhere, right? And, um, you know, I get up. I'm delirious. I end up holding up the try out of nowhere. Like, the dude just ran into me, and I'm just laying there or something. And um, so that, that goes. I get booted from the field. They tape me up. Um, I don't go back in, but I end up going with the uh, this Italian man. His name was Marco, I think, speaking very broken English. And he takes me, puts me in his uh, his BMW, and he starts. He zooms off, and uh, we're driving. I think we're driving to the hospital. We, we drive past the hospital, and I go, "What's going on? Um, like I'm bleeding out here." And he goes, "No, no, no. We're going to Peter's house." I'm like, "Oh, who is Peter?" We go and we crash. His friend Peter, who's an Italian doctor, we crash his <laughs> dinner party. He sits me up. He walks me into the house. It's this Italian marble villa. Sits me up on the kitchen counter. And there's just one guy. And he looks at me, shakes his head, finishes his drink, and then disappears for like 10 minutes. And all the party guests are in a hubbub. And 
just bleeding all over this dude's house, bro. Yeah, I'm just like still holding my face. Um, and he comes up and he's got a sewing kit. And he's, I'm like, this is really about to happen. This is the most hardcore thing like I could ever imagine happening. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. Unfortunately, I didn't get stitched up on the, uh, the kitchen counter. Um, <laughs> but I did eat some of the best Italian food in my life, all home cooked, you know, classic dinner party. So that's, I mean, that's pretty legit. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's a way. Uh, yeah, for those who don't know at home, if you get cut on your forehead, you will bleed a lot. And uh, I had like a scar up here. Like, it's really wild, like how much dudes bleed out of their head. So, You're just leaking. Yeah. It's like a fire um, hydrant, you know? Watch somebody, you got to watch like uh, some of the UFC stuff when you just see like swollen eyes and then when those get like cut up, you know, from hits to the yeah. face. Like that, that is exactly what it's like taking a cleat to the forehead. Yeah, you just bleed and bleed and bleed. So, yeah. all right, man. Uh, thanks for coming on today. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing you get after yeah. it this season. Um, for all those at home, uh, wish uh, Holden Younger awesome luck. He's gonna he's gonna kick some ass. I'm telling you. But uh, we're as far as the the regular show is concerned, we're off until the the eighth. Maybe, I don't know, figure it out. We're off for two weeks, all right? <laughs> maybe maybe another week and uh, look for some other content uh, during that period, so. All right, Holden, thanks. Yeah, great, thanks for having me, Aaron. Happy holidays.